Hey, Ryan here. Does your company have a commercial or industrial IoT project coming down the pipe? Reach out to Vary and let our world-class specialists in hardware, software, data science, and design bring it to life. The technology is ripe for prime time because in large part, we've, we've been able to solve this really classic multi-decade long problem around making 3D printed parts strong in all directions. You're listening to Over the Air, IoT, Connected Devices, and The Journey, brought to you by Very. In each episode, we have sharp, unfiltered conversations with executives about their IoT journeys, the mistakes they made, the lessons they learned, and what they wish they'd known when they started. Welcome back to Over the Air, IoT Connected Devices and the Journey. My name is Ryan Prosser, CEO of Vary, and today we're joined by Blake Teipel, co-founder and CEO of Ascentium. Uh, We're going to be talking about 3D printing versus additive manufacturing. What you need to know, and I'm using air quotes, is additive manufacturing real this time? Blake, thanks for being on the show, man. Ryan, it's great to speak with you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thanks for having me. So I bet, uh, so we're recording this in, in July, 2021, the world is moving fast, you know, maybe a few months from now, it, it will not be this, but I think a lot of people are saying, I've heard of 3d printing. I'm not as familiar with additive manufacturing. What's the distinction and what, what does a person need to know? I'm sure you educate people on this all the time. Uh, a follow-up question is going to be like, where do you guys fit in the additive manufacturing landscape, but a bit of education first. Yeah, that's awesome, Ryan. So the way I, I try to draw a distinction, and there is a distinction, and it's both useful and it's also just dumb. And so sometimes I even use the two to the two terms interchangeably, but uh, I'll try to do my best to, to, again, draw that distinction for folks in a way that makes sense. So 3D printing is a technology that pretty much everybody has seen in the world now. Uh, you sort of imagine that you know, you're, you're, you've got a little, a little desktop machine or some printer and you're building a part. And you get this little widget, or it's uh, a toy, or it's a Yoda head, or an Eiffel Tower, or or some little device that is fun, or it's a tchotchke. Usually, 3D printing is useful to sort of get people interested in engineering, or get people interested in the STEM disciplines, and so it's used a lot in educational contexts. But additive manufacturing is a extension; it's an, it's an extension of 3D printing into a manufacturing context where basically making the part is only part of the journey. And in fact, I would argue one of the least important parts of the journey. You go from a design to the prepared file to the printing of the part. That's like the third or maybe one of the middle steps. Then you pull the part off the machine and you do post-processing of the part to clean it up. Then you actually are inspecting the part to see, hey, was this produced properly? And then you're usually storing data around that part. Like how many instances were printed? Uh, how many good instances out of the total batch? What was your yield? And then you are tracking, of course, the economics, the life cycle, and the costs for each of those steps. And so the 3D printing part is a middle part of the additive manufacturing process. Now, the good news is that additive manufacturing is very similar to actual manufacturing, right? If we think about the built environment in which we all live, we have planes, trains, cars, computers, shoes, apparel, phones, tablets, Alexa, etc., These are all devices produced on supply chains, in factories, in an actual manufacturing context. And so when I think about the moment in time in which we find ourselves now, the thing that gets me excited and out of of bed every day is the fact that 3D printing has matured to the point where it is now finally ready to be relevant industrially in a manufacturing context. And so for that reason, I'm super jazzed about additive manufacturing and what that means for supply chains factories, and eventually consumer parts everywhere. So uh, before, I I have a thousand follow-up questions, but um, talk about like where you guys fit in that landscape. So, you know, Ascentium is focused on which slice of that world? Yeah, so our products today are are center laser-focused parts that used to be injection molded or even are currently injection molded or they're machined out of plastic. And there are many different types of parts that are you know, produced in this sort of classical sense. These are examples, again, of subtractive manufacturing or traditional manufacturing. And so for an injection molded part, if you think about you know, like your AirPods or your, again, many different devices that you have on your desk, like your mouse for your computer, 
These are all composed of plastic parts that are injection molded. And so injection molding is a very common manufacturing technique. It's useful for producing millions of parts that are all exactly the same. And so where additive manufacturing comes in is, let's say, I would like to produce 10,000 parts that are different from the next 10,000 parts, which are different from the 10,000 parts in the batch that follows after that. Injection molding struggles a lot to quickly turn over or change designs between those different types of batches. And so where additive manufacturing really takes root and where Ascentium's focused is how do we engage with manufacturing clients and contexts that are sort of mid-range, mid-range volumes, and how do we really increase the agility with which these customers can sort of change designs or be adaptive or agile or pivotal in a product mix? Uh, so, you know, the CNC milling part is also uh, very common for, in particular, like jigs and fixtures and tools that are used inside of factories every day all over the world. And these fixturing devices are usually used to support or guide or, you know, hold in place the uh, part that's being machined and used by the consumer at the end of the day. So even those parts themselves, the fixtures, for example, or the jigs, those really should be printed. And in fact, with Ascentium uh, and, and others, you know, you get 3D printed jigs and fixturing or additively manufactured jigs and fixturing. And then your factories can be more responsive. They can cut their costs and they can you know, change designs and, 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 and respond to consumer sentiment as it, as it changes. You, it, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I didn't hear you mention it, but I, I remember uh, talking about it in our pre-interview. You guys have kind of a bent in the direction of uh, aero, right? Like you guys are doing qu- quite a bit of work with things that fly. Is, is that, <laughs> have I oversimplified that to, like, is that broadly correct? That is broadly correct. And so, you know, again, pardon the pun, but part of our business that's really taken off recently is our aerospace business. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, aerospace is an example of, a, of an industrial vertical that has really actually been using additively manufactured solutions for a while. And so we are serving uh, multiple aerospace clients in the sort of civilian side of the house or the commercial aviation sector, but then also now in the government side. And so, as many people know, in sort of aerospace, most of the costs for a delivered solution, again, that's something that flies, the delivered solution, most of those costs are actually out in the sustainment part of the life cycle. The average age of airplanes that are flying for the Department of Defense in the United States, that's 28 years old. Most of us don't have houses or cars that are, that are that old. And yet America is flying on old airplanes, right? And so in order to sustain those aircraft, you need specialty tools, you need specialty fixtures, you need specialty solutions that are available at the point of service to turn around airplanes quickly and get those planes back in the air flying again. And that's what we're doing with um, with, uh, with a lot of clients now on the aviation side of the business. So one of the things that vary that we focus on a lot is helping big industrial, or I guess like medium-sized industrial companies that they make a product, they've made a product for a very long time, you know, maybe like embedding intelligence into that product isn't their strong suit. It seems to me that aviation is a very specialty market that you guys have landed on. We see people that are trying to figure out what they should build. And we're often asking them, what informed your decision to select this as the correct path forward? How did you know, like what, what informed for you all that aviation was an interesting path or the path or an area where you wanted to specialize heavily? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, for us, Ryan, honestly, we, we actually responded to some market pull during the pandemic. I mean, a lot of clients on the commercial manufacturing side were either shut down entirely or shut down partly for the better part of a year, trying to figure out, number one, is there an ongoing market for the stuff we're building and the stuff we're making? So the factory might be shut down for that reason. Or when the factory start starting to open up again, how do we bring our employees back safely at scale? And how do we do employee health and safety for, you know, people across our enterprise? Well, the government had to answer those same questions, but the government never shut down because the government can't, you know, can't shut down, at least not for any length of time and continue to, you know, uh, keep the nation moving forward. So during the pandemic, we were able to respond to the, the need that we saw for the investments in aerospace sustainment solutions at scale with lower costs, lower cost profiles. And that's where additive really, really wins is, you know, changing the cost curve for sustainment and in particular in aerospace sustainment. And so 
there were just a number of opportunities and we focused on delivering our core business solutions. That's, you know, high speed 3D printing, a lot of materials, you know, software solutions for the production of printed parts. And we just said, okay, how can we bring this ecosystem to bear for the aerospace community writ large? And during 2020, there were numerous opportunities to actually do that. So we grew our business. We're very fortunate. I mean, a lot of businesses struggled in 2020 and are still struggling now as we're trying to figure out, is the hangover waning? Is the hangover still there? What's going on? Are we still masking? No, maybe we should again. Who knows? It's still a confusing time. You know, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, the government was 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 buying printers and 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 needing to to keep America flying, and so they turned to us uh, to help help uh, be part of that solution. So that's what that's what you know mandated us as a business to to focus to build the right thing, right? To build the right solution at the right time for the right customer. The good news is that additive manufacturing is inherently flexible, right? It's an inherently flexible technology. It's designed not to be a Star Trek replicator where you just sort of push button get part and it's magic and maybe I'll have a steak and some, you know, a martini as well. No, it's like, it's a, it could be useful in a manufacturing context, like a mill or a lathe or an injection molding machine, but it has much more flexibility than all of those types of production assets, which means it's a good time to be adopting additive in manufacturing. You know, you mentioned government. I wasn't anticipating to ask this question, but I think of aviation and I think of like the intersection of, of like, uh, the private sector and the government sector. Mm-hmm. Government puts a lot of things up in the sky. Yes, we do. <laughs> what what has the the DOD position been, been for 3D? Have they been out front in this? You know, have they are have they been quick to adopt additive, quick to to dismiss additive? You know, what what has the landscape been um, on that side of the house? First, I'll just say it does depend. It depends a little bit on the branch of service. If you're thinking about the DOD, it depends on. Other agencies like FEMA or DHS, which are, I think, largely not yet using additive additive manufacturing at all, but there are tons of use cases where additive manufacturing would be relevant for, for example, FEMA. Uh, we could certainly get into that if you're interested. But you know, when it comes to the DoD, I, I I really would give a shout out to the folks at AFWorks and the Air Force. AFWorks is basically figuring out not only how to build upon the historical teams, and I use the word teams here, there are many teams who are engaged in qualification of flight enabled and flight critical parts that are 3D printed, right? They're produced on an additive manufacturing ecosystem. And they're, again, they're flying, right? Like you mentioned. And so the Air Force has been doing this for a long time. There are people at the Air Force Research Labs and at the Lifecycle Management Center, for example. And then now there's a brand new program office that was stood up actually also kind of during the pandemic, really, called the Rapid Sustainment Office. And they're focused on quick turn of aircraft, getting getting those aircraft turned around and back back on, you know, into the sky as quickly as possible. So the Air Force is, I would, I would certainly argue they're 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 you know uh, users of additive. They really know what they're doing. They know how to use additive manufacturing in in in, in a variety of value-added contexts. And I, and I'm happy to say that there are other branches like you know the Army and, and Navy and the Marine Corps. They're also exposed to additive, and I think we're starting to see similar acceleration in these other branches as well, kind of drafting off of the wake a little bit that the Air Force has sort of created by, you know, taking and maintaining and creating a leadership position in additive manufacturing technologies. It's interesting. I mean, the Army's got tens of thousands, if not more, vehicles, right? Land-based vehicles. Right. And so it would certainly be the case that keeping, you know, old Humvees, running for a long time, which seems to be something they're interested in, uh, would be easier and lower cost using additive manufacturing for tooling and for parts, uh, in many cases, driveway parts on Humvees. And you don't have to then worry about the Humvee, you know, falling out of the sky necessarily. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there on the Army side in particular. I, I have uh, so many questions about the government side of the business, including you know, the extent to which, in your experience, their their drive is towards additional capabilities or cost savings. But we're going to save that for the next time you come on the show. Okay. Um, I want the answer to be cost savings. I'm afraid that it will not be. But uh, I want to talk about uh, team <laughs> composition. It's both. It is both. It's capability and cost save. I can, I can tell you that, and the cost save side, just quickly, is about helping the government re- be relieved to the largest degree that it can be from vendor lock, right? You sort of have 
you know, a lot of the, the primes, which have done have built great businesses for themselves and for the government. And they own a lot of the tech data that is used to, you know, produce an F-35, for example, or an F-16 or whatever it is, or a C-130 cargo plane or whatever. But the company owns the tech data. So the government buys the part, the government buys the airplane, but the government can't use the data because the data is still owned by the company. Now, in reality, the question, and I think it's a good question, maybe we could explore it in a future session, but who should own the data? I would argue the taxpayer should have a seat at the table because we funded the development of that asset. And, totally. But the company, but but I'm I'm also I operate a company, so I have to also think about how to preserve my intellectual property that goes into the creation of that data in the first place. So it's a nuanced position, but the government is certainly looking to control their costs, rein in the sustainment costs, while increasing capabilities, and they're turning to additive for all of those um, reasons. I I'm okay. We're not. I you are not. You're forbidden for, to from responding to this statement, but I will just say that if. If the taxpayer did have a more meaningful seat at the table, it would it would be a fundamental shift and not necessarily in a good way in that government procurement process. Because I think a lot of people put up with the headache of the process because they know they're going to emerge with IP. And and so better for for better or for worse, it is the process and change the process. You gotta live with the, the ups and downs. I'm telling you, we're gonna have you back on the show. We're gonna talk about that. Yeah, I'm not gonna respond. Okay. I won't respond. A lot to say. I want to talk about, <laughs> I want to go back what seems like 20 minutes ago to, we we're talking about product market fit. We're talking about you guys deciding to go pretty hardcore after aviation. You know, what did, what did team composition look like as you're looking at, here's the path forward, regardless of like where we land on product market fit, not everybody nails it exactly. You know, we're going to need this core team in place. How are you guys thinking about here are the things we need to be great at regardless of our path forward. And here are some areas where let's go find some great partners because we're not exactly sure if, if that skill set is going to be super critical or tangential or what. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> We had some great leadership wins here. And by we, I mean, I guess I mean me. <laughs> and we also had some particularly painful and unpleasant, you know, learning experiences with regard to to team, right? I mean, people are people and it's amazing to work with people and it's terrible to work with people all at the same time. Right. And, and, and you do your best you can as a leader to try to balance the needs of the organization with the needs of the people that comprise that organization. And that's just... That's just the beautiful and terrible dynamic dance of leadership. But, you know, for us, we had to put in place early on multifaceted, multi-domain capable people. We needed a lot of generalists, right? We were an earlier stage company. I mean, our company now is eight years old. So we're, you know, I, we're still in a, a high growth stage uh, to be sure, but we're not like an early stage startup anymore. But in the early days, we had to focus on, okay, who can I get on the team that knows a lot about a lot? And then, you know, I don't have time for documentation. I don't have time for, you know, recording every little nit of everything that you need on a certain solution. And then when one or more of those people leave, you, uh, you, are, you, you see a lot of talent and a lot of knowledge walk out the door. So we had that happen on a, on a Cornerstone project, you know, uh, at Ascentium. We had to relearn how to... Um, how to, you know, use electromagnetic energy elegantly inside of a 3D printer, which is, it's just not something that most people ever know, let alone uh, have to relearn twice. And so that was expensive, but we, we got there. I got there again. So so staying on the topic of, of challenges, you know, so I, we talk a lot on this show about what I call the, the wrong side of impossible. Hmm. And, you know, a phrase that I'm particularly fond of is, being different doesn't make you the best, but to be the best, you do have to be different. Mm. And oftentimes in technology land, being different means that you've solved a technical challenge that others have not, either because they haven't attempted or they didn't understand the value in solving it. Can you talk about the wrong side of impossible for you guys? Like what, what are some technical things you needed to solve? Sounds like in this case, maybe needed to solve twice that, you know, work. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> Work that one in there again. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for being on the show, Blake. Um, yeah, exactly. So, you know, what are a couple of things that it started as the wrong side of impossible? You guys needed to figure it out in order to to kind of prove out your your value prop. 
Well, we had to prove how to make 3D printed parts as strong in all in all directions, in which might sound like a strange thing to say, but if you get an injection molded part, usually the injection molded part is very close to the same strength. It has the same strength properties in the three major directions like X, Y, and Z, right? So when you build a 3D printed part, you have usually an X, Y plane, and then usually the part is grown or built in the Z direction. So the shape is defined in, F, in, in X and Y, but the height of the part is usually defined in Z. Well, usually the Z direction is very weak because it's a little bit like a deck of playing cards, right? You have the, the playing cards and there are like, you know, 52 cards in the deck. And so if you, if you grab the cards in your hand and you pull on them, in the direction of the playing cards themselves, then they're very strong. But if you just lift one card off the top of the deck, like you're cutting the deck, you just cut the deck, it's effortless to cut the deck because there's no real strength in that direction. The cards are not connected one to the other. And so we had to solve that for 3D printing, and we did. We created 3D printed parts that were as strong in all directions, which means they're isotropic. So you sort of have X, Y, and Z strength properties that do not different that are not different from each other. Which means then, as an engineer, you can actually design for additive, which is like this next phase of a beautiful, wonderful, miraculous future where you're designing to use additive manufacturing as your manufacturing process of choice. But until that time, people have to trust the technology, learn the technology, trust the technology. And so I would posit that the technology is ripe for prime time because in large part, we've, we've been able to solve this really classic you know, multi-decade long problem around making 3D printed parts strong in all directions. So we solve that. And we call that flash fuse technology. That'll be widely part of our ecosystem here shortly. So flash fuse, it, one of the ways that you put it to me previously was proving that you can heat up plastic parts on slow printers. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that, what that yeah. means? Yeah. So when you build, when you build 3D printed parts, historically, you, you sort of have this point source of heat. And it's usually like the nozzle, like the heated nozzle. You can think about like a hot glue gun, right? The hot glue gun has this hot nozzle and it's melting plastic and you're moving the nozzle around and you're printing a part. So the part and the plastic are hot right when it's leaving the nozzle. That's a point source of heat. With flash fuse, what we did is we basically created a halo. You can think about like a halo that goes around the nozzle and it creates a diffuse energy field. And so you can you think about like a shower head of just raining down energy. It's raining down electromagnetic energy. And we started out with microwaves. We started, then we moved into RF. Uh, so that's sort of in the, the megahertz frequency band. And then now we're in the kilohertz, megahertz sort of hybrid band area. And so we're raining energy down on the printed part. Well, you have to couple that energy to something or it's just wasted energy. So we couple the energy to electrically conductive plastics. So our plastics themselves are electrically conductive. So we kind of did two impossible things. We kind of figured out how to rain down energy onto a 3D printed part as the 3D printed part is being built. And then we also figured out how to couple electromagnetic energy to plastic, which is normally inert to electromagnetic energy. It doesn't really heat up. And you put a plastic in, in a microwave, like a plastic fork. You, I mean, the plastic fork might get a little warm, but it's not going to melt. You're not going to melt the plastic fork in a microwave, right? So um, so we figured out how to, how to make plastic electrically conductive. Those are two... Uh, multi-domain problems in involving nanotechnology and material science and chemistry and chemical engineering and, and software engineering and beer, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of hard work. So we got to So, done. you know, <laughs> one of the things that, that we see a lot is, like I said, this, this wrong side of impossible, um, you know, hard problems tend oftentimes hard problems that are the correct problems equals valuable problem solved. What's next for you guys? Like what's the next big, valuable, interesting, hard thing you're going after that, uh, that you can tell us about? I understand there's probably, you know, some things on the multi-year horizon you can't talk about today, but what, what are we going to see out of Ascentium in, in, you know, next, uh, weeks to months? Um, weeks to months, you'll see, you know, additional types of printers. So we're, we're certainly, you know, continuing to, to move quickly down the pitch at, at, a, at, a, at a fastest pace as we can on more and better robots. You know, I mean, the, the printer is important and the printer is not important. You have to have a, 
a great printer so you can process the material and leave behind a, a good part. So you need to really focus on on the robotic side of it, the automation side, the, the servo loop, uh, cl- servo controlled closed loop motor feedback in the machine, the firmware, all the, you have to focus on those machines. You really do. But um, and so you always need to sort of evolve and, and continue to make your machines, you know, better. And in our case, that means making sure that you get great parts off the printer the first time and every time, not just the parts off the printer really, really fast, which we're already really, really good at. Uh, but we want to make our parts themselves uh, better. And in, in terms of that first time print success and the part surface finish and the aesthetics and all these things that are also important to the actual success of the part. So we'll be rolling out a number of hardware solutions and software solutions as well, aimed at the user experience, aimed at that part quality and the part you know presentation itself. So that's going to be a key area of focus for us in the very near term. Also more materials. You know, Ascentium is actually, I talk a lot about the machine. The reality is that we are a materials first company. So I'm a recovering materials scientist myself. And at the end of the day, you sort of think about, well, materials are kind of the thing that matters the most because it's what you're left with in your hand. You put an iPhone in your hand, it's composed of materials. The iPhone is not composed of the mills and the lathes and the machines that made the phone. The materials in the phone are what's left behind, right? So we have uh, a number of materials that we're rolling out. We're really excited about um, high strength, high speed, high temperature materials. So just pushing the envelope for more and better solutions to be brought to bear on the design problems in additive. So, okay, now we're zooming out to a higher altitude, uh, moving to a close here. You've been in the space for a while. You guys are kind of at the crossroads of uh, some cool uh, areas in tech especially, you know, specifically additive in aviation. I think that's not aware of anybody else at that at that particular crossroads. Who who out there in IoT land, you know, what other company aside from yours are you looking at and thinking, man, these guys are doing some cool things. Nobody's talking about them. Could be consumer, could be industrial, could be whatever. You know, who who out there should should the audience be be knowing about, be thinking about? Yeah, I think what one of the things also, I'm glad you brought that up, Ryan, because one of the things that we, we are also going to focus on with some partners, and this is where you, you really need great partners, um, would be certainly on the software and the digital side of the business, making sure that you're managing the, the digital experience and the connected machine experience to the best degree that you can. And so there will need to be solutions around the capability set for network enabled and network connected machines, also the security set, cybersecurity how the machines themselves um, operate in a trustless environment, that's um, vitally important. We can't see, you know, ourselves allowing our customers to get hacked, you know, and that's, uh, you know, cybersecurity profiles are a major concern. And so I would, you know, I'd give a shout out to one of our partners in the space, you know, Materialize is a, is a software company that uh, we've been working with. They're out of Belgium and they make really great software. Um, also, there's a company here in the United States called Dendrite that is out of the Seattle area. And they're working with um, HP as well on the Universal Build Manager. And so you see this movement forward in software in the additive manufacturing landscape. And this is crucial for the next generation of design. The reason why I say it's crucial is because you can now actually manufacture things on the machine that are really difficult to design in software. And so you have, like, we actually now need software to come to the party more completely to enable next generation design. I mean, I was a designer in my past and you could design stuff in CAD that was non-manufacturable, but now it's actually much more difficult to design something that you cannot actually make using additive manufacturing. So the software tools have to evolve, I would argue, to reflip that paradigm again. Because otherwise, if you think about it, where does the next generation of creativity come from? Well, you have to design it and ideate it and create it digitally first, whatever the it is, before you can create the it for the first time in the in the built world, so software's got to catch up. Uh, um, I would say. Awesome. Um, last question for you, Blake. So uh, for folks out there listening, liking what you have to say, uh, how can how can folks keep up with you? Yeah. So definitely head on over to ascentium.com, and um, we you know we update our blog um, postings and our uh, digital and our video content all the time. We've got a presence on LinkedIn. We've got a presence on Twitter. 
And so, you know, take a look there and, uh, you know, we'd love to, we'd love to stay in touch. We, we, we'd love that. We'd love the conversation around how to build, you know, for the future and how to advance manufacturing globally. That's, that's what we think about every day. Cool. Well, Blake, thanks for being on the show today, folks. Uh, that's all we've got for this uh, particular episode of OTA. Uh, if you'd like to be a guest on the show, you, you can email us at podcast at very possible. And uh, if you're out there listening from Materialize or Dendrite, love to have you. Um, otherwise, feel free to, to give us a shout. My name is Ryan Prosser. Blake, I appreciate you being on the show. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you on the internet. You shouldn't have to worry about IoT projects dragging on or unreliable vendors. You've got enough on your plate. The right team of engineers and project managers can change a pivotal moment for your business into your competitive edge. Very's close-knit crew of ambitious problem solvers, continuous improvers, and curious builders know how to turn your ideas into a reality, on time and up to your standards. With a focus on mitigating risk and maximizing opportunity, we'll help you build an IoT solution that you can hang your hat on. Let's bring your IoT idea to life. Learn more at verypossible.com. You've been listening to Over the Air, IoT, Connected Devices, and The Journey. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to hit subscribe in your favorite podcast player and give us a rating. Have a question or an idea for a future episode? Send it to podcast at verypossible.com. See you next time.